I was watching you since like high school. A lot of time you talk about like awareness training. It's very similar to the bodybuilding. Do you still view it as like you're still working out or like is it? No. Yeah, now right now it's just completely letting go. Awareness is max effortly like powerful when you just do nothing. Does anyone not know why we named it dropping the ball? Um, I mean, I know it's, the meditation type of dropping the ball, but yeah, uh, well, yeah, uh, it's from Michael Tapp. To, he calls it dropping the ball. Imagine your dog just biting down really hard on a ball, and then you just let go. That's the entire method, the entire technique of the letting go meditation. And then it's like the mind just wants to grab onto something, like the dog grab onto the ball, and you let go, and you just continue to let go like that. That's the whole practice. When you drop it, you're releasing it. How does a dog drop a ball? You release it. You just release tensions and release the contraction. Some tradition call it do nothing meditation, the highest meditation technique. The full instruction for the do nothing meditation techniques are sit down and do nothing. That's it. Sit down and quite intentionally do nothing at all. Now keep doing it. Now as a society, you have this stigma about like doing nothing. But actually, when you just do nothing, deep relaxation brings about a state of inner aliveness and vitality. Right. The real byproduct of relaxation is a sense of regeneration of the entire nervous system, the feeling of being refreshed, uplifted, and alertness. Now, and eventually, you start to see that you can actually do everything from the space of do nothing, from the space of non-doing. You can have sex, you can lift weights. Pretty much, you can spend 24-7 doing nothing while at the same time doing everything. And that's the ultimate realization, when there's no more distinction or duality between effort and effortlessness, or between stillness and movement. Yeah, so the best way to describe the do-nothing meditation when taking in real life is that everything becomes effortless and you're in a flow state 24-7. Now first, you're just walking around the world as a separate entity, right? There's a lot of effort in just walking. And then you let go of some more, there's only the walking with no walker. And then you relax some more, even the quote-unquote walking disappears. And then there's just luminous appearances, shape-shifting, fluctuating. You become fully engaged with the world while being totally detached. Of course, throughout this process, there's going to be a lot of fear, but it's all about embracing and trusting fear. And this embracing or trusting fear, it gives rise to love, right? And total acceptance. And people talk about compassion and stuff. This is compassion. This is compassion towards yourself. And ultimately, that's compassion towards other people, right? Anyway, let's go back to the technique. So you simply notice when you feel that you're doing something and let go of that. If you feel like you're getting caught up in thought, let go of that. If you don't get involved with thoughts, you stop generating the fuel. You stop feeding it the fuel to continue uh, to proliferate. If you feel like you're getting caught up in emotion, let go of that. If you feel like you're getting caught up in meditation, let go of that. If you feel like you're struggling to let go, let go of that. You don't resist even resistance. If you feel like you're constricting or tightening your body or emotion or your mind, let go of that. You just keep relaxing away all tightening, constrictions, contractions, solidity, and sense of that you're doing something at all. One really good hack to get into the do nothing meditation or relaxation is clench your fists really tight or even your jaws. Just clench your entire body until everything started to hurt. And then you just let go and release. And that gesture right there is the entire process of the spiritual path. That makes sense. Right? So just like notice, notice, notice how you grasp onto the things and then release that and feel the relaxation comes from yeah. the rest of the yeah. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and most people, if they've never done this kind of practice, most people walk on, uh, around the street, so they, everybody's a dog, like have a ball in his, their mouth the entire lives. And the only difference between that dog and an enlightened dog is the enlightened dog doesn't have a ball in his mouth, that's it. You know, but the difference between the two is the difference between feeling like you're a separate entity, uh, being trapped in the head, uh, versus being faster in the sky, but experientially and viscerally. Adyashanta said that enlightenment is nothing more than letting everything be the way it is, end of story. We talk a lot about dropping the perceptual center, dissolving the seer, hearer, doer, uh, thinker. Those tensions in the head that creates a seer is the same process as a dog that's biting really hard on a, on a ball. So we're just clinching here all the time. That's why we feel like there's the subject object split. You know, any tension in your body, if you, if you feel fear, then the ball is like your stomach. And you just kind of recognize it and then drop it. Well, what about if you, you stop to analyze something? The analytical mind, like the, when you lost in thought, you just create, you, it's just a physical tension in the head. 
or when your direction of attention is contracted in the thought instead of on ice cream which is out there it's, but they're both craving uh, right yep. so when you're like over analyzing actually you're doing something that's why the sense of a doer can't really drop without seeing through thoughts. Because if you haven't seen through thoughts, you're just grasping onto thoughts the whole day. So every time like thoughts pops out that creates kind of a hindrance or distraction, you just let go of that contraction. The same way that you release uh, any tensions in the chest or in the body. You just don't stay involved, don't stay engaged with the thoughts, and just focus on the spaciousness. That's Shinei, practice in Zouchen. It's also really important not to uh, try to stop thoughts. You can't let the thoughts be there, just don't be engaged with the thoughts. Trying to stop thoughts is actually a kind of a doing. When you practice a lot, they say that you have the ability to suspend thoughts in action. Uh, but that only becomes effortless and natural once you see through the self, the nature of thought. Yeah, Before that, you kind of have to some sort of effort. Instead of directing your attention to objects of meditation, you're actually recognizing where the direction is contracting and then you're letting it go. So it's not about the content. It's always about like how you do it. All there is to craving is attention contracting or collapsing. So the content of the craving never matters. Without contractions, you get 10 chocolate cakes without cravings or suffering. So you don't actually have to let go of anything. You know, the only thing you let it go of is the contraction and solidity around things. And ultimately, you know, contraction can be there too because, you know, nothing gets in the way of awakening. It's just a story you're telling yourself that, oh, contraction is bad, experience is good. Ultimately, there's no difference between the two, really. And this whole process of releasing is very physical and very visceral. It's not mental at all. Just as I said earlier, it's the same process as releasing the clinch of a fist. Again, you just kind of be mindful of how your attention is jumping from one object to another object. Whether externally or internally, ultimately it doesn't make a difference because there's no difference between inside and outside. You just keep letting go, letting go, releasing, releasing. Eventually, you're going to let go of even equanimity and you have no preference between this state over that state. And ultimately, you're going to let go of even consciousness and then you reach Nibbana. So unlike mindfulness, where you're just paying attention to or concentrating on a very specific object of meditation like the breath or the body sensation or sight and sound, you're actually letting go of attention. You're letting go of any sense of witness or an observer. Because the witness is just a more subtle version of the ego, right? There's a vantage point from the witness pointing to the object of the witness. Or there's a direction of attention pointing from the subject and the center to consciousness. You're letting go of all of them and realizing they're all just contractions. Yeah, if this sounds a little bit complicated. In Tao, just relax. That's all you have to do. Just relax. So this is the other side of the extreme of Vipassana. When we talk about contraction and expansion, this is a, a complete uh, a surrendering, letting go, relaxation practice, the do nothing meditation. How much quote unquote effort do you put into this non-effort of releasing? There can be a little spectrum in there you can play around with and we can talk about that. You can either really just do nothing, not even try to release, or you can kind of go in there and just be mindful of the direction of attention and then just let that direction of attention be there. So that's already a little bit more Vipassana thrown in there. You kind of have to recognize where the contraction is and then releasing it. And then even that process of releasing, there can be a little spectrum you can play around with. When I used to be pretty solidified, the balls were bigger. They're not just in the head, but they're kind of like in the body, all over the body. Very big solidity. So like I actually had to like make more effort in releasing it. So I have to like recognize the solidity and then go in there and take it apart, take it apart in a very, very gentle way, applying as little force as possible. But even that effort is tiny, tiny, tiny amount of effort compared to like drilling your breath into emptiness or like body scanning where you're just like being aware of and dissolving every speck of solidity in your body mind that's max effort concentration max effort uh, attention training versus letting go of attention yeah but the true do nothing meditation when you take do nothing meditation to the extreme you don't even do the releasing part anymore you can the, the releasing part will just be done by itself all you have to do is abide in that fill in the blank or abide in that space where you can't even move it's not like you can't move, but it doesn't feel like you're moving because there's no mover in there. There's no one there to move. There's no one there to drop balls. There's no one there to be, recognize anything. But all the recognition dropping the ball can still happen when you're like, I call it disappearing into the universe, right? When you disappear into the universe, whatever practice you do, whether dropping a ball, even body scanning can be done in that space too. And it would just be part of the objective phenomenon. That, that's the true letting go. You just tell a random person on the street who's never done any practice, just completely let go. They won't they probably wouldn't be in that place because they still have so much tension that need to deconstruct before you can truly abide in that fill in the blank or that singularity where you kind of just disappear 
into the world. Any kind of subjective experience will just be part of the world. That that's where you completely raise the duality between subject and object. When you're in that space, there's no such thing as even subjective experience. Now this singularity has no dimensions, no time, no space, yet at the same time, yeah, it manifests and contains all times and all space simultaneously. So any kind of thoughts and feelings you have is just part of the world because you, you raise the subject. So from that place, you can still do the practice, but it won't be you doing it, it will just be the universe doing it. See, if you objectify everything, the subject disappears. So it kind of feels like there's only the objective world, uh, which is the same thing as saying there's only the subject with no objects. But if I have to lean towards one side of the description versus another, it feels more like everything is the object. Everything is objectified. But this objective world, quote unquote, and its objects and phenomenons are holographic, empty, and luminous. But to get there, you have to rewire your mind to a certain degree already to be that relaxed. Yeah. And to be relaxed, like I said, the best description I can have is like, you can't really do anything. It's just been done. But then in that state, it actually feels like a, a form of like cosmic concentration. Because you feel like this entire feel, for lack of a better word, is just kind of concentrated on itself. So like when I look out into the world right now, that the, the, the buildings that are like, you know, on the next block or whatever, it's actually being concentrated in the same intensity as when I look at my finger. But it's not just like front and back, right? It's all direction. But actually directionality is also a construct. So you can say that awareness is equally awake in all directions, which makes it panoramic. It's this whole field is equalized. But of course, the word concentration is it applies some kind of effort. So you know it's hard to describe, but it almost feels like awareness is just there, and awareness is always just itself. It's always you know perceiving itself in a sense. But even this field is not like a stable thing either. You know, for liberation to happen, you can't hang on to anything, not even any sense of a ground or like an eternal awareness, Brahman or consciousness. So anytime you experience some kind of absolutism, uh, there's a self in there. Whether it's big self or small self, it doesn't matter. There's clinging in there, and there's some identification that you haven't looked through. Eternity still presupposes time, and infinity still presupposes space. You go beyond the beyond. So this whole notion about awareness being some kind of a substrate or a container where sensations or objects are rising in and out of must be deconstructed. There's no container of space and time for even transformation to take place. The world doesn't become Brahman. Emptiness doesn't vibrate into form and vice versa. Brahman is the world. When you collapse time, all sensations are non-arising, non-abiding, and non-seizing. So it's kind of like a video game, right? So when you become this entire game, whatever isn't rendering in the present moment doesn't exist. So the simulation begins and ends with your direct experience of the isness. You can't find the present moment. They say that you can't step into the same river twice, but actually you can't even step in the same river once. You know, if there's only the flow, even the river disappears. Ultimately, there's no distinction between foreground and background. So instead of experiencing awareness as this background substrate, a container that uh, sensations are passing in and out of, awareness itself, not a ground, is just part of the cause of the conditioning, just like everything else. So when you become this entire clinical field, every time you shift your head a little bit, it's a new feel. Awareness is constantly refreshing itself and then collapsing, refreshing itself and collapsing. And it's happening so rapidly that it rising and passing away happens spontaneously and simultaneously. Without the process of time, there is no arising and passing away at the linear fashion. Speed of light, when it's going so fast at the speed of light, everything becomes a standstill. So there's a sense of stillness and stability uh, when everything's free falling on groundless ground. And this is when you go beyond even coming and going. That's what the word Tathagata means, which is the word that the Buddha chooses to call himself. The Tathagata is truly gone but not yet arrived. You can't even find the consciousness of a Buddha. And this is when you go beyond or collapse in a duality between existence and non-existence, neither being or non-being. And to truly experience this, you just gotta completely relax and do nothing. And you can't experience to do nothing at this level if you still have a center. If there's still a center, there's gonna be a bubble to experience. So instead of looking at time and space as some kind of a container, space and time itself, or even consciousness, is just more sensations more mental construct. But be careful not to verify sensations either. So yeah, there's absolutely no proof in your direct experience right now that it's the same awareness that you're using to perceive the world versus like 10 years ago, five minutes ago, five seconds ago, or even like somewhere down the line in the future. Whatever you think is eternal awareness is just being fabricated right now in the present moment that is also empty. And when I say emptiness, I'm not saying things don't exist. Neither am I saying they exist. <laughs> I'm not talking about some kind of inherent voidness. 
Emptiness is not a substrate, it's not nothingness, it's not the source of everything. Emptiness is not stillness, not silence, it's not having no thoughts. And it's definitely not nihilism. And when I say emptiness, again, it's just the process of how everything is a codependent rising process. This arises because of the condition of that. And when the conditionality of that ceases to exist, this ceases to exist. And awareness cannot exist without the object of awareness, and vice versa. Even nothingness is just another object in awareness. Brahman or Gadamai are just more processes of causes and conditionings, and not the source of reality. So nothing has an inherent existence apart from this codependent rising process. There's no other one because everything is changing, except for the projection that yourself is still hanging on to. Even having awareness is conditioning. That's true. Yeah, but then you don't you don't have a conditioning around the conditioning. Even just like all, every word I'm saying here is conditioning. Yeah, that's right. yeah so if, if everything is conditioning, then nothing is conditioning. <laughs> If I have to describe what you are, you are the intersection of infinite webs on infinite webs of causes and conditionings, and all of them are impersonal. So you are neither the same or different from conditions on which you depend. You are neither severed from nor forever fused with them. This is a deathless teaching. So you are neither separate nor one with the universe, and this is the middle ways teaching. Do nothing meditation is simply a process of unbinding any resistance to this interest net, where there are no nodes. No separate controllers, observers, source, or consciousness outside of the stream of dependent arising process interacting, where even the strings are empty. I talked to a physicist yeah. yesterday. He was like, You simply disappear into entropy, into the laws of nature without interference. Samsara is not other than nirvana. Yeah. Well, there's absolutely no duality between awareness and sensations, perception, or objects. Everything becomes kind of disjointed. But this disjointedness actually creates a kind of a peace and stability. And this is the middle way. It's that which transcends even a distinction between impermanence and permanence, between the one and the many. If you're holding on to oneness, you haven't seen through emptiness. If you're holding on to emptiness, you haven't seen through emptiness. Even the notion that quote, everything is a construction is in itself another construction. But for the do nothing meditation, I do think it's kind of important to just let awareness be a ground. This boundless, vast spaciousness, timeless awareness is your object of meditation in, in, in do nothing meditation. And then you just stay here until like thoughts come up, contractions come up, hindrances come up, and you recognize it, release it, go back to the object of meditation, which is the objectless awareness, which is still an object. So why are you still practicing? Like the Zoshan people say you hold the view. Right? There's still a little tiny bit of effort in holding the view. Now, if you can hold boundlessness, you gotta be pretty relaxed. And then eventually, you wanna walk around and just do very difficult things even while holding the view. Ultimately, you're gonna let go of even that view. And the view is just gonna hold itself without any effort from you. That's when you let go of letting go and surrender to surrendering. So the paradox is, when you take the do nothing meditation to the end point, you're not even trying to do nothing anymore. You're not even trying to be aware. There's nothing to hold on to. There's nothing to push away and there's nothing to let go of. Don't rush forward. Don't step back. Don't stand still either. You know, some of my videos I said the seeker can never wake up or the ego can never meditate. And you get a really deep insight into this once you take a do nothing meditation to the max effort degree. The field knows itself, sees itself uh, with intense clarity. Uh, we can also experience it like when you see an object, it's kind of like glowing. Lu kind yeah, they call it luminosity. luminosity. The luminosity is just awareness. Yeah. And since all sensations are equal footing, the building five blocks down and my finger right now are equally self-cognitizing. And they're cognitizing in their own place, so to speak. Even though this distance is also a construct. And that's why you also get a sense of like there's no distance. Right? Because if everything is the same luminosity. If every clinical particle of this whole field, including the sensation the air, are made of the same thing, they have to, they have to be neutralized. Because the direction of attention is actually what's making a certain portion of the feel more desirable or more luminous than other ones. That's actually a form of contraction or clinging. Sometimes people like to do the do nothing meditation with their eyes open, completely relax their eyeballs so like their peripheral vision is actually the same as whatever is like directly in front of them. Because without this direction of attention that's prioritizing a certain like spots of the field, it's just this whole field is just one spot. 
and it's boundless. Yeah, and it also gives you the insight that you're not looking out through the world. Ultimately, you'll feel like you're blind in depth because there's no seer, there's no here, right? That it's very easy to get an insight into how sight is just seeing itself. And that's the most direct, the simplest way to perceive reality. When you're sitting around or waiting for all your coffee or whatever, just constantly trying to relax the eyeball. There's so much conditioning in the eyes or in the jaws, or just in the head in general. Cause like there's so much conditioning in the visual field. So just completely relax the eyeballs as if they're just like floating in the back of your head in space. And then take an entire field and do not look at any particular objects. Even after you realize anatta, oh, my analogy is like you, you, you see a tree, after you remove the trunk, all those leaves and branches can still be there. They're just like floating in midair. And the rest of the path or like the path of integration, cleaning up, is just let those leaves and branches are still floating in the air because they, they were so conditioned to think they're attached to their trunk, I'll just let them dissipate, let them dissipate. And you can see that even after you remove the subject-object duality, when there's no more direction of attention going from the subject to the object, there can still be embedded within each floating sensation some kind of attention there, just due to conditioning. So that's when your practice gets really, really subtle. This little floating thought here, even though it's not coming from a thinker, it's still a little bit contracting. Why is that? Because there's still embedded in there the illusion of direction of attention that's still trying to grasp onto an object. And you just recognize that and release it. So it can be dropping a very big ball or dropping a microscopic ball. But even like Vipassana, even though I say it's like on the other side of the extreme, when you get down to it, when you get to the more subtle realm of the Vipassanalizing, you have to start to Vipassanalize, not just the Vipassanalizer, but the Vipassanalizing. Because with Vipassana, you're, you're, it's all about like training your attention to like pay attention to the head, pay attention to the sensation in the forehead and go down your body. Right? There's direction of attention involved, and Sam Harris called that kind of uh, meditation dual mindfulness. And then the non-dual mindfulness is kind of just, well, I call it doing vipassana from the god mind. Other traditions call it vipassana. So when you do vipassana, it's kind of the merging of do nothing meditation and vipassana. It's vipassana from the perspective of the infinite space. But to even do that, you have to have some kind of access to the, the spaciousness already. So that's why at the end, even vipassana is no different from do nothing meditation really. If you take Vipassana to the end point, you're gonna end up in the same spot as do another meditation and you're gonna start doing Vipassana just automatically. Uh, you also need a certain amount of concentration and mindfulness to be able to detect very subtle solidities and contractions. Not to mention you need a certain type of mindfulness and concentration to be able to hold infinite space before you eventually let that go as well. Now the reason why in Dzogchen traditions, they ask you to do a few years of preliminary practices like dual mindfulness and vipassana and concentration for a couple years before they hand you the quote highest teaching of the do nothing meditation. Why? Because the more you can contract your attention to a size smaller than an atom, the more you can expand and come out the other side and become infinity. A lot of the Zen traditions, they don't even go into Vipassana or self-inquiry, they just tell you to sit. Like Their whole practice is just sit. If you just sit and stare at a wall for 10 years, you're gonna release all your contractions and conditionings. But if you throw in some Vipassana and concentration work in there, I bet the process will be faster. But then people are like, which one's faster? Should I do Vipassana or just sit, right? You're drilling the mountain from both sides. Some people just drill it from one side and then they go through it. Some people drill it from the other side, they go through it. Some people do a little mixture of both, they drill it from both sides. Another practice you can do is meditate on emptiness, quote unquote. It's kind of like a version of the do nothing meditation. You focus on the empty space between objects or the air or the space between thoughts, meditating on negative space. But the ultimate insight is bringing that negative space into form and realizing that there's no distinction at all between form and emptiness. Yeah, so maybe there's a way you can stand on the grass and I'll be on the edge. So all you can see is mud and water. Okay, we can do that. Yeah. I'll stay on the grass, and then you're at the edge. Yeah. Can you show the guys the map of uh, the constructing sensory experience? Uh, the four levels of experience from dual vipassana to non-dual vipassana to do nothing meditation. It's like we talk about that four layers, four stages, right? Uh, first, like when we when we approach vipassana, vipassana from the body scanning route, then we take the conceptuality into phenomenon, uh, into phenomenon, into waves of changes and into awareness. But now, when we talk about letting go and still scanning, so to speak, then it's like abiding in that awareness and then go up, go up, go up again. You're abiding in the fourth level, 
was just pure awareness. But then all the more solidified version of that on the top, like concept can still arise. Sticky thoughts can still arise. Or like emotional tensions can still arise. And then just kind of dissolving the solidity on the top of the stack into and from the fourth layer. Only to realize there was never a distinction between awareness and sensations or between perceptions or anything. When the subject, the object, and the direction of attention that points from the subject to the object are all seen as part of the field, then it's easy to just like dissolve them and just see that another insight just again is to see that both the subject, the object, and the direction of attention are also just self-luminous sensations that are just a little bit more contracted than the vast spaciousness. Oh, that's insane, dude. A lot of people, the first time they experience the awareness, like spacious boundlessness, that can be such a big experience for them that they can go like insane for the next two months. If they still have a lot of emotional baggages that haven't been like seen through or whatever, which is of course, that's gonna be the case for almost everybody. That's why people after they access the vast patients, they're gonna go through periods of like integration or even feeling like dark night of the soul. Yeah. It's the, the rest of your conditioning to respond to this groundlessness that creates this grasp and this fear. Same with bliss. Or even like- Bliss is actually a yeah. form of contraction actually, yeah. One of the most common one is abiding awareness is and the rest of the self think that awareness is either you, you rarefy into like a, some kind of a substrate or you just like frame this whole thing around like the nature of reality or okay, a reality is made up of awareness, I am awareness or God, you can easily get stuck in there. In the do nothing space, this, it, it's, it's not a state really. Th that fill in the blank, that singularity doesn't actually exist. I used to say it's like this singularity that manifests all of existence, the non-existence that manifests all of existence. But there's not a transformation there. It's not like, oh, I'm body in the singularity, and then I watch everything vibrate into existence through the fill in the blank of non-existence. That there can be a stage like that, but even that duality is completely gone. So it's just it, what it is. I think Adi Ashanti calls it the dark light of the absolute. I actually made some slides. Yeah, let's do it. Let's, let's, see the let's see the slides. If you look at Thursday's writing, then he says, don't underestimate what it means to let go. So I invite you to pause the video and really uh, spend some time looking at his writing. But essentially, he says there are even different degrees and stages towards letting go or towards do nothing. At first, we may think that it's just, okay, a matter of just drop effort. How hard could it be? But actually, then we wouldn't really have the ability to penetrate into experience, or we don't even have the ability to rest in just the what is. So actually, one way to look at letting go or do nothing is cultivating max effort samatha, which is resting, and vipassana, which is penetrating and seeing clearly with no effort at all. So it actually can be said as a quite advanced practice <laughs> in that way. And... Even when you cross into non-duality, there could be still that eternal awareness, that eternal uh, consciousness pervading everything. That's that background that everything is arising out of. That could be something that's not let go of. So yeah, uh, a lot of teachers like Super, uh, Rupert Spira or anyone who emphasize on that uh, really Brahman idea of an absolute reality, if, they, if you tell them to let go of that, maybe they would have resistance towards that. So yeah, letting go is not something that easy to do. Simple, but maybe not so easy. So yeah, like today we're talking about the third of the trifecta that we mentioned from the very beginning. So we talk about concentration, uh, self-inquiry. And now today we're talking about the uh, do nothing side of it. So stop resisting resistance. On one side, we can actually feel there's an increase in lightness. On the other side, we have an increase in acceptance or just ability to roll with whatever is going on. And from these two axes, at first, a lot of people talking about like firmly renouncing contraction. Immediately when you, re when you recognize there's a contraction, you release it and then you relax and you keep doing that. So that's like, that's starting from a pretty heavy place with not like, you don't really accept contraction as it is, so to say, you still do something with it, but then even that gets also dropped or gets seen as a resistance to, because you're still choosing with between this, this side and the other side. You're still sure trying then, to like hold the view. Then, There's still a little bit of effort in there. 
even on the microscopic sensorial level that could also apply you can get obsessive about trying to find every contraction and then releasing it and releasing it but then you realize where there is actually you don't even need to release anything just let them be there they will be sucked into the infinite but in the beginning the, you, you do kind of have to like practice how to release what does that even mean to release is it just letting things be there and not do anything at all from the dynamic center's flow yes ultimately yes but then for a lot of people they can't do that yet they have to kind of work their way into the truly do nothing. So then the, 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 even the word release can have different connotation. I mean, there's like a more gross kind of release where you you recognize the solidity and then you kind of just go in there and then just release it, release it. And then maybe less and less, even that, just let it be there, let it be there until like you're not even trying to let anything be there. That's why I always say you got to strike the right chord, the balance, the perfect balance between effort and effortlessness, between surrendering and intention between alertness and relaxation. And just adjusting that dial is the play of meditation. It's almost like playing music, just finding the perfect balance between expansion and contraction until both disappears. Because it's so balanced, you can't tell the difference between expansion and contraction. Kenneth Folk has this really interesting model he calls three speed transmission. Like he makes an analogy between the different practices and different states of consciousness as driving this car with uh, three speed transmission. Right, the first speed, yes. the first speed is your Vipassana contraction, mindfulness, concentration stuff. The second speed is more like self-inquiry or awareness of awareness. And the third speed is the do nothing realm. Yeah, it's the centerless dynamic flow where you just think flow like the whole time without even trying to abide in shine, even trying to be aware of awareness. But you can, he said you can, it's like a car, you know, sometimes you need to be in first speed, uh, sometimes you need to be the second transmission, sometimes the third. Like uh, potentially or ultimately, the goal is to be in the third all the time. If you in the third, like 99% of the time, and then this 1% you had an argument with your wife, and then you can still do Vipassana, even from three. So this graph right here would be kind of like the, the three stages within the third stage. You can just start, start to perceive the fractals in, in your practice. After the Nata, all your practice is going to be effortless. When you experience reality as this infinite self-driving car, even when you hit a bump on a road, the car will just automatically course-correct itself through the course of the least resistance.